So, with me is Scott Miller, director at the International Center for Clinical Excellence in Chicago. His influential work has focused on the research of what makes therapists more effective and what practices they can engage in in order to have better outcomes in therapy, including the use of feedback as a way to tailor the approach to the particular client. Scott is also author, co-author, editor of many books and articles, including The Heart and Soul of Change, a book that's become a kind of a classic for people interested in research in psychotherapy. So thanks so much for having us, Scott. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I see your work as a researcher, as a real breath of fresh air in a field that's sometimes filled with uh, dubious assumptions and myths and some not so scientific remarks in a way. And before yeah. we talk a little bit about your work as a researcher, I think it'd be really interesting just to know a little bit about how you came into the field. So I wanted to know if it was a gradual or an early thing, this decision to become a therapist and a researcher. No, it wasn't gradual. I was an undergraduate student and a major in accounting at university. And uh, I took a beginning psychology class with a man named Hal Miller, who if you look in uh, all of the books I've ever written, I always thank Hal <laughs> because he's really responsible for why I'm a psychologist. This beginning therapy class was uh, – a, an amazing experience. He didn't require that the students actually attend the class. At the very first time I, I went the, to the class, he laid out how you could get an A, how you could get a B, how you could get a C <laughs> just by doing the material. And he said, you don't have to come back. But his lectures were full every single day day that he lectured. And students were actually in the aisles and in the hallways. Many of the students weren't even uh, registered for the class. Uh, he was such a compelling researcher. And really what I wanted to be uh, was Hal Miller. Uh, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to think like him. Uh, he moved me. It was an identity that I, that I really wanted to aspire to. Uh, and so I, I worked with Hal. I became a research assistant for a while as an undergraduate. Uh, he was a Skinnerian um, uh, experimental psychologist. He actually had graduated from Harvard and worked with Skinner. And at one point, he pulled me aside as I was getting ready to apply to graduate school. And he said, uh, sort of as a colleague or mentor to colleague, uh, he told me that uh, the amount of money that I would make as a professor in experimental psychology would never be um, uh, enough to live on huh. and suggested that I go talk to Michael Lambert, mm -hmm. who was working at the comprehensive clinic, the student clinic at the university that I was attending as an undergraduate, uh, to see if uh, clinical psychology might be an option. I went to talk with Michael. He wrote some letters to get into graduate school, and that's how I decided to uh, become a therapist. Incredible. Actually, we're going to have Dr. Michael Lambert in two days in Lisbon, and it's really yeah. interesting you're coming up with that. And I'm tempted to ask you immediately, like, uh, how was that shift? Because it seems that your um, relation with psychotherapy came mainly as start from a research point of view. Yes, yeah. it, it, it did. And, you know, both Hal Miller and Michael Lambert were both researchers at their core, the true example of scientist practitioners. So, of course, Hal did that in a lab with pigeons and Michael did it in a clinic with students. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a fantastic transition. Michael and I now have uh, known each other uh, for nearly 40 years. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's an amazing process. He was hugely influential. Joel helped me, I think, with his letter mm -hmm. and the work that I did for him get into graduate school, and I've uh, maintained contact with him. And I think Michael really has single-handedly changed the focus mm -hmm. of uh, psychotherapy research. Uh, for a very long time, he labored without much recognition, I think, formally in the field, while our field was obsessed with particular methods for particular diagnoses and still is in many ways. Michael was talking about common factors and deterioration in treatment mm -hmm. and measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think Michael ultimately has um, uh, been uh, shown to have a more appropriate clinical focus. Mm -hmm very early on, which is amazing, right? 
I mean, well, like a lot of people, you know, they're not. I think uh, Ken Howard, who's here where I live, uh, was here where I live in Chicago at Northwestern, was also talking about uh, how clients, for example, experience change in treatment. And while uh, his original findings on the dose effect re- relationship were revolutionary at the time, they were also for the most part, really ignored uh, until uh, much, much later. Well, when we think about people like Rosenweig that talked about common factors in the 30s, it's kind of incredible, right, to think about that it was almost like 80 years ago or something. It's really impressive. Yeah, and, and it, I, it is really <laughs> impressive. Yeah, and, but that was actually one of the questions I wanted to make, and now I'm not sure if it's at all relevant, is if there was like an offer or a text of psychotherapy that early on really influenced you. But maybe you came from some more research-based field. Was there any offer or text? Well, I think if the uh, I think the one thing I really got out of my graduate ex- school experience was the ability to do and think about research. Mm-hmm. What graduate school did not do uh, very well for me is prepare me to do therapy. Uh, and I really wanted somebody to help me know what to say and what to do. Mm-hmm. I, I truly believed that there, uh, if therapy was supposed to be helpful, that there had needed to be some structure. And I was uh, told that I should go to therapy myself. I was told that I should learn from that experience how to do therapy. We read lots of very generic texts mm-hmm. about counseling and psychotherapy process, which I thought were great, but they they really didn't help me feel confident about my skills. Mm-hmm. So in the, in the meantime, I also met a couple of other very important people. One of them was Lynn Johnson. Lynn was uh, a uh, person with a strong scientific sense, but also spent his days in, in front of a mirror doing practice. And he invited me to come down and sit behind his mirror and watch him work. He was heavily influenced by the uh, interactional school and uh, the solution focused school and then Milton Erickson's work. Mm-hmm. And so I got introduced to all of that and through him met uh, Insu Berg and Steve DeShazer and I went and worked with Steve and Insu between 1988 and 1993. Yeah. I lived in Milwaukee and worked with them. The thing that happened though at Brief, while I became very confident and learned how to do, I think, therapy mm-hmm. uh, uh, in that specific way, researchers came in a bit later and the things we were saying about our work, that we were briefer, more efficient, had more single session cures, mm-hmm. uh, and were more effective, simply didn't pan out. We weren't any more effective than anyone else. And we had no more single session <laughs> cures and we were no more brief than anyone else, which led to a, uh, a choice. I could stay and I could do my therapy approach or I could follow what the data seemed to say. And I think my um, training and my own internal compass said I had to, I had to follow the data where mm-hmm. it led rather than try to make the data fit my, my beliefs. And that pattern has replicated itself multiple times throughout my career. Mm-hmm. So uh, we uh, began to notice problems with the whole common factors perspective as early as, as, early as 2000, really, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, why would anybody learn the common factors if all models are equally effective? Yeah then there's really no need to learn about the common factors. Just do your particular yeah. model. And I heard you also, uh, that, sorry, I, I heard you also write about uh, how would the common factors approach really look like just based on the common factors, right? That's right. And yeah. it's, it's, it really is uh, a paradox to say that there's a common factors approach. Yeah. Common factors are common to all <laughs> models. Now we're going to develop an approach specific to common factors. Yeah. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when we began measuring and mm-hmm. suggesting people measure. Yeah. Measurement led us to uh, identify that certain therapists were better than others, mm-hmm. and that's where our efforts are, are focused now. So I've always followed the data, and it's always really yeah. led me in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. you, you are c- completely research-informed, which I find actually very courageous in a way because you're working on this model, solution-focused brief therapy, and then you kind of have to abandon it towards the research that's being done. I can imagine that yeah. you passed through your life through various phases of discontentment and uh, disenchantment with the work you were doing, maybe, because the research would tell you otherwise. That must be a hard process, right? Well, um, 
I, hard, I, I, I don't know. I think the hardest part was letting go of the personal relationships associated with whatever we were working on at the, at the time. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't stay at Brief Family Therapy Center, continue work on Solution Focused when the data was saying that yeah. it, we were missing the point. Exactly. Uh, and I couldn't continue to work on the common factors, really, mm-hmm. when the common factors really were missing the point again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, well, just going back a little, I also know that you had uh, before an analytic, long-term analytic therapy, and then you went to see a single session with a brief therapist. Can you tell us that story and what you might have learned from that, looking at it now from perspective? Well, I I would say that the first, I did have a long-term psychoanalytic relationship, um, and uh, the the I think the first six months of that relationship were great. Uh, I, I think being able to talk about my life and experience an empathic connection without judgment was was very helpful. But this went on far longer than I think needed, and uh, I also got worse during the process, and I think in part because of what we were focused on. Uh, and so uh, I decided at some point, I'd seen somebody at a workshop and I decided that I, I needed to get some help, uh, mostly because I thought I needed to go back and finish this analysis because I'm a guy who likes to finish things. <laughs> so um, I, I went and saw a, a, a well-known brief therapist who um, told me that uh, after, after we'd spoken, he said, I asked if he had any advice and he said he did and he told me to roll the level or blinds open in my office. This is what he, he said. Uh, and the, the, I, I thought he was crazy and I was <laughs> upset as well that I'd paid somebody to tell me that. But the next day, I went to my student office at the time and I, I did it and the light poured into the room and it was as though a light went off in my head that here I was seated in my office in the dark mulling over all of my thoughts and experiences in life and I was ignoring what was going on in the outside world. Yeah. And so as a result of that consultation, I within a very short measure quit uh, that particular analytic relationship and, um, uh, and the issues and concerns I had really, really sort of disappeared uh, That's as a, a result. Story. Yeah. I can imagine that this connects very well with uh, how you start then investing in the importance of feedback because it seems that in that particular relationship, if feedback were have to, were used, well, I, I can imagine that a lot uh, earlier on you would have shown this discontent and maybe change focus in therapy, which didn't happen. Yeah, I think that if anything, what it reinforced for me is that outcome is more important than process because I I believe that multiple times, not multiple times, after about three years or so, I was telling this analyst this every visit that I was getting worse, that I wasn't doing well, that I was having a hard time getting out of bed and uh, his recommendation I'll never forget was to go on drugs Uh, and I thought this is when I decided, you know, uh, and I had just uh, coincidentally seen this other therapist in a workshop and then made an appointment and went to see him. Yeah. Uh, so I think that when we place process above outcome, we miss the whole point. Yeah. And uh, our process is not important unless the client gets better. And if the client doesn't get better, then mm-hmm. our process is harmful yeah. and we need to change it. And I had this idea and I think my analyst had this idea that if you just finish the process, then all would be better. Exactly. And mm-hmm. – uh, you know that's that's not something that I that I buy, and it's been hugely influential. And I say in workshops to this date, mm-hmm. in consultations, I say, outcome trumps process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this uh, is kind of connected with what we were saying. There's these dubious assumptions, and you're saying one of them, right? Like we just suppose that a process could eventually lead or should eventually lead to outcome. That's not necessarily true. Actually, I, I would no. like I would like to ask you a little bit about that, but. You know, in Portugal, there's still not a big culture of feedback systems, using feedback in psychotherapy. And since your work is so based in routinely measuring using specific formal feedback, I would have to ask you to just briefly tell us about what is formal feedback and maybe even more specifically the ones you have developed, the measures, the outcome rating scale, the session rating scale. Could you just briefly tell us for people who don't know what this is? 
there are a couple of places they can get, also get more information. They can go to my personal website, which is scottdmiller.com, or another website uh, is called whatispecoms.com. And both of those sites describe this idea associated with routinely monitoring the outcome of the work. Our group decided after our flirtation with common factors that maybe we wouldn't be able to figure out how to tell therapists to work, but what we could do is identify when what they were doing was or was not working. Mm -hmm. So we'd, uh, I'd been a longtime user given my relationship with Mike Lambert of the OQ45. So I started using the OQ45. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my one uh, mentor and friend, Lynn Johnson, had a 10-item scale called the Session Rating Scale, which measured the quality of the working relationship. All I did was put those two things together and then after a while be uh, decided, uh, given the clientele that I was working with, that they were too long. They mm -hmm. took too much time. And we didn't need an MRI at every session. What we needed was a stethoscope, something to check the heartbeat. Hmm. The outcome rating scale was developed to see whether progress was taking place in the client's well-being from visit to visit. By tracking this, I could see where, was the client improving. And if not, then that would alert me so that I could talk with the client, further establish collaboration, hmm or change directions, even on occasion, switch therapists. Yeah. Uh, the, the SRS also gave me some feedback, uh, a short version of it, the session rating scale, about the quality of the working relationship, something which has a really high correlation with, with outcome. the outcome of yeah. care. So we began, again, I began measuring that, created a smaller, shorter scale, yeah. and uh, began using that outcome at the beginning, SRS at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since that time, things have really evolved. So we now have predictive algorithms. So you can actually plot your individual client score against a normed trajectory based on several hundred thousand completed cases of treatment that predicts, it's a predictive trajectory. You can plot your client against a trajectory that says this person is on track for success or failure. Yeah. Uh, depending on what you're doing. And that's also part of the magic of that is that uh, we've, you've also talked about and there are many studies about the self-serving bias in, of psychotherapists. In a way, we're not very good at noticing deterioration and the signals that uh, clients send us. And also part of the importance of these feedback measures is that we can actually see if it's actually getting better and how is the relationship. Try to get away from that self-serving bias. Do you agree with that? <laughs> I, I do agree with that, mm -hmm. and I, I think sometimes it's hard to imagine that we have a, uh, a bias in how we interpret the cases, and our bias is kind of uh, what might be called rosy, rosy view. Mm -hmm. we, we often think clients are progressing when we're not. We don't see the deterioration in our clients when they are, in fact, deteriorating. Mm -hmm. So when a therapist says, I know, uh, we have plenty of data that suggests that, that they, they don't, and they don't at critical <laughs> junctures. At the same time, as Mike Lambert would say, why would we expect therapists to be able to see that? Mm -hmm. We don't expect physicians to be able to judge your blood pressure by looking at you. Mm -hmm. Why would we expect physician or psychologists yeah. and therapists to, to notice that? So yeah. adding a simple tool, a blood pressure cuff in medicine, a me measure or a scale in psychotherapy, Seems like a reasonable step to take. Yeah, and maybe an essential one. Let me go through some of the ideas that I've heard you also talk over the years. And I think this is important because there are some huge ethical challenges in our field in a way. I mean, we, mm. you, you've talked a little bit about the amount of dropout, which is very big in therapy. And mm. almost 10 or around 10% of the clients get worse. In children, it's even worse, like 20%. We have this yeah. bias towards uh, our capacities as therapists. We think we're better than mm. we usually are. And knowing mm. this feedback system seems like the ethical, common sense thing to do. But mm. at the same time, we know that it's, so, it's still hard for therapists to ask and receive feedback. And it's rare in many communities. So I'd like to ask you, and I know there are some studies about this, but I'd like to know your take on this, about what are the main barriers for therapists to use feedback in therapy? Well, I, I, I think the main barrier is, number one, lack of knowledge. 
uh, I think people hear about this, and um, or, or but most of people don't hear about it. I, I as I travel and I teach workshops, I'm I'm surprised really at the number of people who've never thought of it. Uh, or encountered it, mm-hmm. or if they do encounter it, it's presented in an unpalatable way, something that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, uh, secondly, I think uh, um, there's inertia, and the assumption is that what it's really about is using these two simple scales, and once you do that, everything will be fine. And what, we, what we've learned is something quite different. We've learned that changing behavior especially among therapists and healthcare providers, takes time and it needs support. Uh, this whole emerging science of, uh, about implementation is uh, so exciting because it tells us that we have to go beyond good ideas and we have to even go beyond good evidence to figure out what's it going to take to get people to do the right thing. Uh, and there are some steps associated with implementation that when followed – tend to lead to success. Even today, we still have problems with healthcare professionals washing their hands. This is nearly 200 years after Semmelweis's research showing that it, it, it saves lives. So it's not a matter of just knowledge. Uh, it's, it's helping therapists and supporting therapists in changing their behavior. Yeah. Uh, and that that I think takes that I think takes some time. And do you think that fear can also be a driving force here? The fear of um, being open to finding out if we're effective or ineffective, because feedback has this idea in it that we'll, we're going to find out. You know. <laughs> well, I think that I think at one time I I thought maybe that it was uh, some th- something about fear but i think that pr- places too much of the burden in terms of implementation on the therapist the individual therapist's mm-hmm. shoulders uh i think that really most of the therapists i meet have a strong desire to improve they attend a huge number of workshops they think about their jobs on a daily basis. They ruminate about their clients. Therapists really do want to get better. It's one of the core idea, uh, core elements of their identity. Uh, at least this is what the research of Orlinsky and Runestad tells us. Mm-hmm. So the question is how to do that and how to support it. Currently, the system supports a way of thinking about how therapists develop professionally. We mm-hmm. say you have to earn a certain number of professional development points to maintain your license. Mm-hmm. Despite the fact that there's no evidence that this type of activity leads to improved outcomes delivered to clients or even professional development. But this is the tradition. That's where I say the inertia uh, of the system. Uh, So that whole way of thinking about how we develop professionally has to change. That kind of thing takes time. While I think there's some fear, what I really think there is more of is um, simply a lack of support for better practice. Yeah, and misinformation, as you were saying about that. Yeah. You know, in Portugal, the idea of monetizing therapy results with feedback measures, it's still very young and probably like almost non-existent. But I've noticed that in some countries like Norway and Sweden, they seem to have really quickly developed a community of feedback-informed practitioners. And I, I was curious if you had any thoughts on the kind of factors that you think contributed to this on a more national level. Like, do you think it's a, a cultural, economic thing that could have helped the implementation of that in those specific countries? Well, I I think... Not to disagree, but perhaps to do so, that uh, I, I don't see either of those places as developing quickly. Uh-huh. Um, the uh, you know I was I was in Norway in the year 2000 talking about these ideas, mm-hmm. and uh, over a a long period and the dedicated efforts of thought leaders in each country, uh, and I would say specifically in Denmark and Norway, you have a large and growing. Uh, interest in the use of feedback, mm-hmm. and most recently in deliberate practice. So I wouldn't say that um, it was quick. It may <laughs> look that way from the outside. Yeah. Uh, the it, it actually was a long time, and it continues to evolve now. Yeah. That said, I do think that certain policy changes can facilitate this <laughs> process. When the government gets in the business of identifying which treatments they'll pay for, this to me is likely to 
delay a more feedback-informed culture. It reinforces the very worst habits, in my opinion, amongst practitioners, which is once I know this method, then I really know stuff. Now, I'm not saying the clinicians actually think that. That's what the system engenders yeah. when it says, you're going to do this method for that problem, and that's what we'll pay for. <laughs> that's the message, yeah. Uh, I, that's the message, and you can see certain countries where this is happening, and it's, I think, problematic and gets in the way of, yeah. of a more feedback-friendly culture. Yeah. Um, so if, if, if governments and if organizations said that we're primarily interested in the outcome mm-hmm. of your work mm-hmm. – and that's what we want to that that's what we want to see evidence yeah. of outcomes. Yeah. Uh, then the process would take a back seat, mm-hmm. I, I and remember, it wouldn't be so important how those. Mm. Yeah, you know, I remember you writing also about like in Britain, for instance, there was this uh, big uh, push for cognitive behavioral therapies to be implemented, mm-hmm. and a lot of money was used in that. And mm-hmm. I remember reading about that because there was a worry that well, maybe we're missing the point here maybe we're going to lose so much money doing this and the outcomes won't get a lot better Mm -hmm. and i can imagine that's also what you're talking about like uh, if we focus just on these wrong processes it's possible that all that effort could go to nothing right well the in sweden for example the government invested huge sums of money in training therapists to do cbt their their of course intentions were very positive they have a large number of people uh, as do most industrialized nations have have a large number of people who are disabled by depression and anxiety mm-hmm. they go on disability and they they don't come back to work that's not good for them it's not good for the economy it's not good for their families so they really wanted to see what would help what did they do well, they bought the line that if they all did cbt then the outcomes would be better mm-hmm. they spent huge sums of money they trained therapists and the outcomes were not better they were worse yeah. so what our consumers need is choice mm-hmm. What the payer needs is outcomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking what you're saying now, uh, we've also moved a little in the research from just using the feedback measures, but actually looking at what actually is going on. And it seems that more recently, in the recent years, the research has pointed out to the nuance of what really matters is how you use these measures. And yeah. I'd just like to ask you a little bit about this. I've also I've read your articles about this, Bruce Lampold's articles, and I will be interested to know if you could share with us just some lessons you've learned about the proper use of feedback measures. Well, I, I tell therapists that the measures are stupid. <laughs> they really don't do anything. And if they were all so helpful, then we would just mail them to the clients and they could sit with them and they would be all better. <laughs> The, the measures really are just a finger pointing at the moon. You know, let's not look at the finger. Let's look at the moon. Uh, we're looking for how can I better help this client, which means, of course, I have to find out when I'm not helping the client. Secondly, I have to find, is there evidence in my outcomes of uh, deficits or shortcomings in my performance that might affect more than this one client that I could work on? And identify those and push my performance to the next level. And the comparison that we use is to athletic performers. The performance of every single Olympic event over the last 100 years has improved. Every single event, in some cases by more than 50%. The performance of therapy has not improved in terms of outcomes since the first meta-analytic resource which was done in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Now, people have all sorts of excuses. It's always interesting when I bring this up. Oh, you know, clients are more difficult. The world's more complex. <laughs> no one says, what do we need to do to get better? Yeah. That is until I harangue them a bit. And then they're, then they're focused because, as I said, I think therapists really do want to get better. Yeah. But it starts perhaps by swallowing a bitter pill. And that bitter pill is what we're doing and the way we're thinking about yeah. improving doesn't really work. Yeah, we, we've been focusing on the wrong processes in a way. That's yeah. right. Yeah, just uh, I don't want to take a lot more of your time. I know that recently you and your colleagues published a study called Do Therapists Improve with Time and Experience? And yeah. again, the results of that can really shock some of the common sense ideas that we have about therapy. And just yeah. briefly, the therapists on the whole did not get better outcomes as time goes by. And you That's even right. found a, a small deterioration of outcome over time. Uh, That's so, right. 
years of experience do not correlate positively with outcomes. How do you think no. this ties in with what we've been talking about with the importance of feedback? So the world and the universe, it's either expanding or contracting. There is no staying the same. So you either get better or you get worse. There is no staying the same. And on average, the therapists in our study, despite having access to feedback, actually their outcomes declined over time. We have another study that's not out yet that is also done by uh, Simon Goldberg. It's just under review at centers that are doing the full process. So they're routinely measuring outcomes, using that, those outcomes as feedback, and they're engaging in deliberate practice, which really means looking for areas of weakness in my performance, making small process and outcome goals, and steadily working at improving skills in those particular deficits and areas. That particular study found exactly the opposite finding with small improvements at the individual therapist level over time. And that's what deliberate practice is about because the overall outcome of therapy at the individual therapist level is good. But once you're good, it's very hard to get better. It takes a lot of effort, and uh, I think it's easier in a way to fool oneself and think one is better than one is. Once you have the data stare in your face, mm -hmm. you now know that you've achieved a certain level of performance, and you can also see that you're not getting much better over time unless you do these three steps. Yeah. So it's the deliberate practice stuff that we're really on to at the present time, and I'm very excited and uh, very hopeful about this. Mm -hmm. And it answers the question that really got me into the field, from the very beginning, how do I do therapy and how can I get better at it? Those were the two driving forces. Yeah, and in a way it's very liberating this kind of research also because the authority of just because I'm a 30 year experienced therapist doesn't mean I'm a good professional. So no. it comes with some, as you said, it's a harsh pill to swallow sometimes, but it's also pretty liberating in a way, which is very interesting. You know, once you move to the side that you're talking about, it is completely liberating uh, because almost anything might help my client. I just have to measure and figure it out and focusing on me getting better really shifts the focus from mm -hmm. models and methods to uh, having the client in the center yeah. and me trying to figure out how I can get better. Yeah, Scott, thank you so much for your time. I would like just My pleasure. To, I would like just to ask you, like, I, I really want to suggest people to go check out your blog that I think is great. I really want to congratulate Thanks. you on that. And maybe you could leave us also with one great book that maybe sometimes is not so talked about, be it psychotherapy or psychotherapy research. What do you think a beginning therapist should read? I honestly, I don't find many psychotherapy books that I find interesting personally. Mm -hmm. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of articles that come out uh, every month that are so much more interesting <laughs> to me. These are research articles. What I would say is the facts are friendly. This is a quote from Carl Rogers. Mm -hmm. The facts are friendly. Start reading the research. Don't be, don't be shy about it. Uh, and stay away from the interpretation of the research by others. Scott, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure.